Welcome to the Write the Damn Book Already podcast. My name is Elizabeth Lyons. I'm a six-time author, and I help people write and publish powerful, thought-provoking nonfiction and memoir without any more overthinking, second-guessing, or overwhelm than absolutely necessary. Because let's face it, some overthinking, second-guessing, and overwhelm is going to come with the territory if you're anything like me. I believe that story and shared perspective is one of the most potent ways we connect with one another, and that your story, perspective, and insights are destined to become someone else's favorite resource. For more book writing, publishing, and how the heck do I move through this glitch tips and solutions, oh, and plenty of free and low-cost resources, visit publishaprofitablebook.com. And for recommendations of fabulous books you've possibly never heard of, book writing inspiration, and the occasional meme so relatable you'll wonder if it was created with you in mind, follow me on Instagram at Elizabeth Lyons Author. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this next episode. Getting the opportunity to interview Alex Strauss was an experience that ended up being sort of beyond my wildest dreams. I got more and more excited the more I learned about her. And thank you so much, as always, to the fabulous Jean Steele for introducing us to begin with. She's so incredibly accomplished. And what I wasn't prepared for is how completely hilarious she is. Alex is a trend, culture, and lifestyle journalist. She's an award-winning four-time published author and a frequent contributor to the New York Times. Her books include The Joy of Funerals, which was originally published 20 years ago by St. Martin's Press and was just re-released three days ago for a 20th anniversary re-release through Palagram Press. And her other books include Based on Availability, which was published by HarperCollins, and Death Becomes Them, Unearthing the Suicides of the Brilliant, the Famous, and the Notorious, which was also published by HarperCollins. She's also the editor of Have I Got a Guy for You, which is an anthology of mother-coordinated dating horror stories. I've got to get my hands on that one. That was published by Simon & Schuster, and her work has also been optioned for several TV and film projects. One of the reasons this interview was so incredibly fun for me is I'm such a believer in the fact that authors have to be the biggest, I mean, we don't have to do anything, but it's lovely when an author can be such a champion for his or her book. And I don't know if, besides Mary Bell, I have yet met someone who is as big a champion of her book or books as Alex is about the joy of funerals. Actually, I take that back because Kristen McGinnis is as big of a champion for her newest book, Live Through This, as Alex is and as Mary is. But it's an incredible thing because I think so often authors feel a sense of wanting to be in the creative space and create. But then when it comes time to promote, many of us just, we kind of want to hide in the corner. And I've long said that you have really got to believe in your book more than anyone else, more than your agent, if you have an agent, more than your publisher, if you have a publisher, more than your family and your friends and all the people who are cheering you along, along the way. There were several surprises in this interview, several answers to questions that I thought would be one way and actually ended up going another. And I think maybe what's the most fun for me about interviewing guests is almost inevitably, the minute we get off, I want to go write. There's something about the community of authors, and Alex and I chatted a lot about the community of authors and what a compassionate and supportive space it is, that without talking about bestseller status, without talking about dollars, without talking about notoriety, but simply talking about the act and the art of writing, it gets me back in the space of wanting to be in it and wanting to get back into creating my own next work so that I can maybe borrow some of Alex's confidence when I go out and share the next one with the world. All of Alex's information is in the show notes, the links to her books, the links to her website, her Instagram, all of the, all of the things. I encourage you and invite you to check it out, to follow her, and to enjoy this episode. Okay, so October 2nd, which was now two days ago as of the recording of this, we are relaunched. Speaking of um, sarcasm, the jo- I don't know, it's not sarcasm, but the joy of funerals, we are reissued. And you and I had a very long conversation. It was funny because we said, let's just hop on a quick call because we had never met. And I was, of course, introduced to you by the fabulous Jean Steele, who seems to be introducing me to all the fabulous people. 
She's great. She's, she's so just a lovely. You know what it is? She's just a lovely person. It doesn't take a lot. Just be it a lovely seems, person. You know what? It does because not a lot of people are. I agree. So it actually does take a lot. And when everybody says common sense is it not so common. Right. Not so common. It's a whole situation. Um, people listening can't see me completely redoing my claw clip in a way that I did learn from Instagram. I did. Um, so there are benefits to social media. And it wasn't even TikTok. So there you go. But we said, let's just hop on real quick. And an hour and a half later, we were both like, oh, my God, I have to go. Like you and had somewhere I, to be. I had to. Yeah, yeah we both was, needed a drink. It was, it was a whole thing. <laughs> yeah, we got a little riled up. And so, but I want to revisit the part of the conversation because there are parts of the conversation we probably shouldn't share publicly if we care about our longevity in the world. But um, the part about you reissuing the Joy of Funerals, because it originally came out in 2004, right? Three. Three. It was interesting because my first book came out in 2004. So we're, okay. we were both kind of coming up on like the 20 year anniversary. And it was with St. Martin's Press, The Joy of Funerals. Yes. And what compelled you to say, I want to do a reissue 20 years later? So much. <laughs> um, the first thing really was I, I, I was early to market and we got we got great, great press. So we really, I think publishers don't always know what to do. I think they mm -hmm. they buy stuff and then they're not sure what to do with it. And so we really were early to market. We were considered the Sex in the City meets Six Feet Under, which you, at the time in 2003, when there was no Instagram, there was no Facebook, there was no Twitter, whatever we're calling Twitter now, <laughs> um, and or podcasts, or any of these other extracurricular activities that are making us insane and severely ADD. I just don't think that they knew what to do with it. I don't think they were ready for a title that said the joy of funerals. I think grieving and loss and dark comedies were still these taboo subjects, you know, not the dark comedy so much, but the other things you know, you can't say funeral. You didn't go to cemeteries to hang out, which you do now. Now there are grave talkers and the grave talkers go and they hang For out. At the yeah. Oh, yeah. And they sometimes if there's a recipe on a headstone, they will make the recipe. And I mean, I don't know what kind of can't be a long recipe, but I guess they're making a recipe and they're eating the meal with the deceased person. And I think that's nice because the deceased, you know, they're lonely and they haven't had people stop by that much. I have so, never heard of this ever. Oh, yeah. It's a real thing. The Times did a, a whole piece on the grave talkers. And I'm fast. So we are having. So some of it was early to market. Some of it was, I feel like I missed my moment and I didn't want to miss the moment again because here we are 20 years later. And I think 20 is a big, it is a big birthday or anniversary. You know, usually at 20, you get a car, somebody gives you a car. Maybe people are thinking about marriage or dating people or you know, there are these big milestones and I don't think, why are we not reissuing? Why are we not stepping up? Why are we not doing that? So I thought, why not? Let's do that. And I, I also thought people are now talking about grief. Grief is, you know, and loss and loneliness. That's the new epidemic. Right. And I, I really saw this 20 years ago. I could never have imagined a pandemic, but I, I think even more so with social media and I had a friend say to me the other day, they're like, oh my God, it was so great to see you, you know, last week. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, last week when we were at that party, I'm like, by the way, you missed me at the party. You were there early. I was there late. You saw me on Instagram. So those relationships, wow. <laughs> they're not even relationships. They're, right. they're visual, they're visuals. And that is not, you know, texting, not a relationship or it's a type of relationship, but we're really missing out on connecting with each other. And so I think there was this perfect storm of, I was early to market, people weren't ready for it. You've got titles now like, I'm glad my mother is dead and sorry for your loss, which are number one bestsellers. And, and now it people think nothing of a title called The Joy of Funerals, except the old age homes. You know, they're not too fond of it. Well, and I thought it was funny because I said to you, I love the paradox. I did too. And I, I do think it's interesting that maybe 20 years ago, there are certain things that we just weren't ready for. I'm curious about what your, you know, people who published 20 years ago, and I did too, 
had such a different experience when it, I mean, you were traditionally published. I wasn't, but either way, we both had completely different experiences when it came to marketing and getting the word out. And there, you, some people might make the argument and they're not necessarily wrong that we almost have access to too many things now, right? Like everything and everyone is at your fingertips via your cell phone. But on the flip side, I found you through social media. I found Gene through social media. I run my business with the help of social media. So it's not all air quote bad. I don't want to give it too much of a bad rap. No, I I think, you know what we didn't do? We didn't look at social media like a research tool because that would have been great. If we looked at, I love that you and I met on, on social media. And I think social media is terrific for the things that it's, terrific for doing. I have friends that send out requests for people that they're looking for to highlight in an article. It's no different than some of the other platforms we had before social, before Instagram. And and really Instagram is this amazing tool, but that's what it is in some sense, as opposed to a lifeline. And I think there are people who use it as a lifeline instead of, it's not a tool per se, but it's just, it would be great if they were able to incorporate it. And I think there are people who are 100% addicted to social media. I I, I think that's that next, you know, that that next level where I want to say to people, it's my friend who thought she saw me at a party. Like you didn't see me at the party. Right. I also think touring is completely different. It's so oh different my god, now. it's so different now. And I still have so many people ask about a tour, whether they're self publishing hybrid or they want to go traditional. They're like, "What about the tour?" In fact, so many people will say, "Well, I want to go traditional because they'll send me on tour, and I have to go." No, nope, no. Nope. And even if you're a very big name. You might get a mini tour, but a lot of people don't want to tour because it used to be that you had to. That was the only way to get in front of people. Now you can get in front of, if you want to, you can get in front of people virtually and you don't have to tour. But there's some downside to that too, do you think? I mean, again, we're missing the connection point of face to face. There's so many things, uh, you know, I really didn't want to be the norm array of touring, but I ended up somehow being the norm array of touring. And I believed in touring in, you know, 20 years ago with, you know, the first iteration of the Joy of Funerals, where really the, my publicist uh, said, you know, we're really not going to do anything for you. And I'm like, then why'd you buy the book? But yeah. I think, you know, and, and not every, look, you're right. Not everybody loves to tour. and I do. I I, I really, I, it's a love-hate relationship because I believe in the book party. I believe in touring. I be, Nothing is as tangible to me as a book. You know, so to, again, during the pandemic, I think we all shape-shifted so well. Mm-hmm. And that's really where the technology was utilized almost for good. You know, you want to say, yes. oh, Glenda, you know, you you did it for good. Um, we got creative about it. Yes. And, off, and I felt horrible. I was so heartbroken for the authors that were supposed to go on tour and were not able to, for the, the ones that it was either their first rodeo or it was, it was their 15th rodeo. There is something so tangible about handing someone a book and being able to physically sign it. You know, that's the whole point where you get to meet the author and be part of that community and part of that, that reading. And I've also read at at places where there was one person and, you know, they were there by accident. So I completely, (laughs) I completely, you know, we all have those horror stories and I I don't know if that's earning your stripes. I don't know if that's saying like, oh, you know, that's amateur hour. Wait till you hear this one. Or, you know, I think I once went. I was on some crazy tour and I went after a masturbating specialist. And I'm like, that's that's a hard act to follow. Like that's, you know, that's a hard, that's a hard act to follow, especially when you're on on tour with a book on suicide. So you oh know, my that God. is that is that's, not, I'm sorry, but that's kind of classic. Classic, classic. Right. You know, it's hard to follow that hands-on experience. So but, but, 
I, I, but I, but yeah, but you know, yeah. the, the other thing is there again, and I feel like, you know, four score seven years ago, you know, I'm like, I've got the Walker and, and if I had a, a phone that had a rotary and my yep. milk is being delivered by a guy on a horse and squidding, you know, but there, again, there, it was such a different, the choices and, and you to even understand what matters, how do you, there's so much noise. I'm waiting yeah. for the noise to become music and the, the noise mm. hasn't really become music for me yet. So I, I don't know. I have some author friends who are like, you only want to do podcasts. And then I have some author friends. I like, you don't want to go on tour. You just want to have, you know, an Instagram tour. And then I, I have some friends who maneuver through this so beautifully with, which, you know, I'm going to, you know, the uh, aquatic foundation and I'll be reading, you know, underwater with, you know, you know, a Jack Russell terrier. And then we'll be doing a very erudite and I'm getting paid $50,000. Oh my God. I want to do that. I forget the, I mean, I'd take the 50,000, but I just want to do underwater with the Jack Russell terrier. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. So I, and I've not, I've not figured, I feel like I'm, I'm learning how to maneuver Mm -hmm. through the buffet without being a bulimic at the buffet. You're right. Because right. I don't believe in street meat, you know. I don't. I. Right. I, not, I don't. I don't believe in shrimp that's been out all day long. I'm Jewish and from the Upper East Side, you know. I know yeah. what I what I can eat and what looks good and what doesn't. But I I still believe, and and maybe that's on me. I I don't know. I've tried to incorporate all these other. Uh, opportunities and these other wonderful channels. And at the end of the day, how do you assess what works best for you? How do you assess where supposedly this greatest, the greatest um, opportunity I have in one sense is time? So do I, do I focus my time on planning a book tour? Do I focus my time on reading in libraries? Cause I still believe in libraries. Do I focus my time on you know, getting on a plane and going somewhere and, and, and nobody knows me in that city, but I'm, I'm hoping that through social media and through Facebook and through Instagram and the shout outs and the friends of friends and saying, do you know anybody in, you know, North Carolina that, that will bring traffic? Is it, right. is it having a, you know, a hashtag? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. What's the most fun for you? Like, which one are you? I mean, because in my experience, it's all trial and error. You could, you might think, I might think I hate something or I will hate something. And then I do it and I think, God, I, I actually really enjoyed that minus this X part of it, which then maybe I cannot have as part of the experience the next time. Or I think I'll love something and then I go do it and go, I, we're not doing that again. So a lot of it just ends up being trial and error. Is that your approach? Or do you know to a degree, hey, I'm going to do this and not this. And then secondary to that, how did you develop your sense of, um, I guess, comfort and confidence with other people saying, you've got to go do this and you thinking, nope. It's a great question. I, I, it's a hard one too, because I've really tried to enjoy the ride because nobody else put me here, but me, that is 100% on me. In the same sense, I really believe I'm my own best investment. I, I would hope you believe you're your own best Absolutely. investment. And I hope everyone listening to this can, because that's like the best advice I could give someone is they're their own best investment. And if I'm going to work this hard, and I think part of that is maybe why we're authors and freelancers. And I, I also believe a lot of authors have something to say. I think a lot of writers, a, a lot of um, journalists, a lot of us who have a, a love of storytelling really feel we have something to say. And I really do believe everyone has a voice and has at least one story in them. Some of us, maybe we have more than one story, but I don't think it's enough. I'm not that person who can just write the story and then say, well, I wrote it and there it is and not do anything else with it. I'm just, I'm just not that person. And I did want to have the book party. I wanted to have the book party and I wanted to reach out to as many people as I could to book the speaking engagements because I really do love the speaking engagements. But part of what I, I'm concerned about is we're not in those moments anymore because we're so focused on the next moment. And right. did we capture this? And it's just going to go back right. to this Instagrammable moment. 
So I have a, I have another friend who said all you need to do are sort are take these photos in front of the libraries or in front of the bookstore so it looks like you were there. And then I'm like, but you know, I'm a journalist. The whole point is not to cheat the shot. But I do want to be thoughtful and I do want to be strategic and I do want to be smart about it. And I I I am I'm really good at understanding PR and I'm really good at understanding branding. And when you are good at, at that, it's also very hard to sit and, and on the sidelines and say, I'm just going to do three podcasts and I'm just going to do three speaking engagements and I'm just going to do one reading at a bookstore and then I'm done. The only way I know how to be responsible for something's success is to try everything I can. And then I can walk away saying, well, you know what? Nobody fought harder to make this work. And so if it didn't work, I'm free and clear and I will right. go off to the next book or God help me. I will go off to right. the next book. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a love hate. It's a very, you know, publishing is wonderful and awful and amazing and terrifying. Horrible. Yep. It, it, it's all those things. I, I it's like think- parenting, you know, I mean, I would say, you know, people say, well, what's your, what was your favorite age of your kids? And I say all of them. And they say, well, what was your least favorite? And I say all of them. Oh, that's interesting. Cause I love, I love three to nine. Those are oh, my God. favorite ages. Really? Yes. Because they're, they're so. Three, I almost, I almost turned it in at three. Oh no, three. They are five de- times are over watching them develop. You are literally watching them yeah. become people. I was watching and- something. Yes, but you also, and I'm a big believer in in really every moment counts and everything. That during that time, it's such a learning opportunity. And they really take in so much. It's all about coping skills and, and <laughs> which well, teaching okay. them how to maneuver through this world and giving them autonomy, but making them feel, you know, important and love, but letting them yeah. go a little bit and, and giving them a voice and not making them have yours and I just well, love no, and to be to clear, you're, I agree with everything you've said. And to be clear, like I, uh, we had great moments when all of my kids were three. But when everyone yeah, talks about the terrible, is, t- but not everybody is is gonna have you know. That doesn't mean it's easy. It no, just oh my means god. It's when everyone shaping. talked about the terrible twos, I was like, you know, we'd be in the twos, and I would think I don't understand what everyone's issue is with the twos. Like this is going along. Then we hit three, and. It happened three times. I think by the, my fourth, I was just numb or something. I mean, and but it is such, it is an incredible uh, time of, not to get into a whole thing on parenting, but it is. They're wildly open and beautifully unaware of things like social media and highlight reels. And what you see is what you get. And, and they're, they're so very smart. present. They're so smart. I can't believe I mean, they're smarter than some adults I know. I mean, it's just all day, fascinating. all day, and they behave better than some adults I know. So uh, agreed just, completely. A hundred percent agree with you. Yeah, it's, it's but you know, it is just like where were we with the the? I do want to talk about your your launch party because this is so fun. I can't even stand it, and people are often curious. Well, how do I get creative? about a launch party? How do I make it different? Everyone's, everyone, well, not everyone, but the majority will think, I want to do it at a bookstore. And I'm like, okay, outside the box. The bookstore is the box. And I love bookstores, but like, let's go outside the box. So can you talk about this launch party? Because it's amazing. Sure. I love bookstores too. And I I, I don't, you know, a bookstore is not going to let you bring in a mixologist and they're not going to let you bring in all the other people that that help also create. Now, an I know event. This is gonna, yes, and I'm going to sound like that awful person because I fell into. See, I may not always love social media, but I, I understand the importance of it. You know, it's right. it's like having someone that you're dating where they have a very big job, and you're like, I don't love that. You know, they go off to work for 19 hours, but I understand that sometimes they're operating. You know, they they have to right. they have to finish the operation. So, bookstores are great. And uh, I think you, here's my philosophy. I think you have several opportunities for big book moments. 
if you're scrappy, and I, only, I think only really smart, scrappy, like thoughtfully scrappy people can say that about each other. Like scrappy became a bad word somewhere. And I would like right. to say that, you know, scrappy is just, you have to really work for, you know, what what you have and you have to work hard. I have friends, I call them, you know, I had a friend called Lucky Girl and she just would like think of something and want something and say it. And then it would like miraculously happen for her. That is not me. I am the person where I'll have this great idea. And then suddenly like I have to rent a tow truck and I have to rent, you know, um, somebody to drop the plans. And then I have to figure out how I'm going to, you know, jump a fence and it does the fence have, you know, man eating dogs under, I mean, like there's lots of things does not just happen. So I think you get book launch, you get your book launch day and you have that opportunity for your big press for the Q and A's and the profiles and the reviews, hopefully. I think the book party, if you do it correctly or do it well, or really give people another reason to write about it or cover it or photograph it or anything that has a life of its own. And I think that's really what I wanted to do for the joy of funerals. So 20 years ago, I went to Frank E. Campbell Funeral Home, which is an extraordinarily historical funeral home here in New York City in Manhattan. Judy Garland had her funeral there. And I thought if it's good enough for Judy, God damn it, it's good enough for me. That's right. And um, I asked, I said to them, listen, I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but... I would really love to have a book party here. And the fellow who was the funeral director at the time, Kevin Mack, was really gracious and he didn't escort me out. And he got it. Like he got the idea and he's like, okay. And so 20 years ago, we did that and it was catered. We had a harp player. I put a gift bag together where it really took someone from the minute they get that call about someone has passed away to when they got home, they're like, oh my God, I can't believe I saw four ex-boyfriends and your mother was insane. And, and, and this thing happened and somebody tried to feel me up in the, I'm, I need a shot of vodka. So it had all those components had it, it had Illy's coffee. And I think it had Tito's vodka. And so some people I went back to again for this iteration, but you got to be really willing to do that. And I, I, mm-hmm often take, you know, six months off to, and not off because I'm still juggling the articles for the New York times and, and, and the other stuff that I'm doing. And I'm also working on God help me a true crime podcast and things that I, you I are, really, I am crazy. I, God, I, that's a whole separate conversation. Whole now separate, I have to set up a separate call with you. Okay. Separate call. <laughs> and, but I, I, I believe, I believe in giving this an opportunity to, to have a second life, no pun intended. And so for this, Mm -hmm. 20 years later, I went back to Frankie Campbell and there's an, a new fellow there. His name is, is Bill William Villanova. And he's amazing. And he was like, he not only got the vision, he was all on board and he said a hundred percent. So we're bringing in a mixologist and we're bringing in a, a harp player and we're getting an obituary cake and we're going to have the flowers and we have good grief cookies that are going in the gift bag and a candle that was created called uh, paying respects. And it smells like coffee and cream. And they're just, we have Tito's again and Illy stepped in and I'm giving away tissues and waterproof mascara and we're having the funeral teeny and they're just out of the box Ways yes. that other people can celebrate this moment. I don't think this will be where they, no one's going to review the book at that moment, but they may take a moment to say, we're going to write about this party. And in writing about this party, there's that opportunity because we all are, we're, we started our conversation. It's full circle. We are an infomercial for ourselves right now. You can't get on social media without someone saying, here's where I'm speaking and here's where my book tour is and here's the design I made and here's, you know, the box of chocolate I'm selling and here's, uh, it's all, it's all so much. It's so much. How can we know where to even go? But it's a lot of eye candy and it's going to be a lot of eye candy. And I, I do believe in also creating an experience and it's experiential. So you are not only celebrating the book, you're celebrating the book in a venue that matches the subject. And it's it's 
whooshed in and cocooned by all these other elements that also support the vision between the funeral teeny and the obituary cake and all these other elements that are now it's it's a book party but it's so much more than that so i two questions came up and i was writing them down as you were talking cuz otherwise they're they're gone um the first one is how do you or do you temper your expectations then for a party like that do you go in with a, a, an expectation is there a subconscious expectation does that question even make sense? So that it you makes tremendous sense. And don't feel I, disappointed if no one reviews it or no one covers it or no one photo, not photoshops it, social media is it or whatever. And you've put a lot of time, energy, and, and frankly, if they money. photoshop me on a good day, though, in I'm, I'm delighted. So I have no problem with the photoshopping. That's uh, true. I, none whatsoever, especially if they can take out some of the wrinkles. <laughs> I I am also not that person, I can't, I can't go into something saying, well, this is going to suck, but we might as well do it anyway. It's not my strong suit. I I'm, and the irony is I'm such a logical, realistic person, but I'm smart. And it's very hard to be both smart and to not have high expectations and to think, you know, that can work against you too. You can, you can be too ahead of the, again, you can be too ahead of People are terrible at RSVPing right now because they all have ADD from social media. So, and it's New York and they have lots of other things to do. And they're in the middle of like, I have a brilliant, I have a lovely agent, but she also has, she's also got a bourbon company that she started. I have a terrific editor, but my editor also wrote a book. So she's on her own book tour. I, the, the painter who was painting my apartment has a podcast. I mean, like, Everyone now has a side hustle. They can't possibly right. come to everything. And now there are more events than ever. Why? Because we have to compete with everybody else who's got right. more events than ever. It is so like how hard is it to RSVP? Clearly, very hard to RSVP because people are slow at RSVP. And I don't know what I'm doing after 3 p.m. today. So if someone invites me to something in two weeks, and I, this is a a I guess a downfall of mine, or a, a I don't know. But I'm like, that feels, you might as well have just invited me to something in 2028. Why though? It's not that hard. But I know. Clearly it is. It's All a mental you have to thing. do is click something and then you write 100%. it down. You write it down. You got invited. And that's the difference between weddings and funerals because funerals, you don't have to be invited. People just show it's word of mouth and everybody comes yes. hopefully to yes. pay respects and to celebrate this person's life and weddings. Boy, are you going to be outcast if you don't show up at this wedding because it's a wedding. And so everybody wants an invite to the wedding because they also want to feel like, oh my God, how did I not make the wedding? Right. So, you know, and still my guess is people are late to RSVP to the weddings. I, People, it's a destination oh, sure. wedding or they got two weddings or I can't tell you how many people have said to me, like, I'm, you know, on a cruise that day or I'm visiting Afghanistan or I've got my own podcast or I'll be doing cocaine in the bathroom and then I have to go to a wedding. I mean, like there's <laughs> it's so crazy, but I, I really do. I know I know if I build it, people may not come, but I again, I have to go back to that. I'm fucking building it. I hope I am allowed to say that I'm fucking oh, building my it. Word. My favorite yes. word too. I was trying to be so good for the, the first no, no, no. 33 it, it, minutes. It only can last so long, you know, it's like Tourette's. I have, I have <laughs> fuck you Tourette's. It's I, I have to also believe I, you know what? I don't have to believe, but I, right. it, it's, it's hard. It's hard to, it's hard to, sh to be the only person to show up. I want I really wish people could come back to being accountable. I really wish, you know, when people say it's not that hard to do the right thing, which we talked about earlier, it obviously right. is because there's so many people who don't do the well, right thing. I think to your thing. point, there are just so many distractions. And I think this happens so much now with authors who have an event, whether it's a big event, like what you're putting together or they're just doing a signing, you know, at their local bookstore, at an indie bookstore, at a coffee shop, whatever. And oh, I and mean, that may be enough for people. That's okay too. I don't know that want part, you know, that, that part, maybe yes. they just wanted to do one and done. Maybe that's all they wanted. Right. I'm referring to all the people who say they're going to come to those things and then don't come. 
Yeah, right? I have no patience it's, for that. It's That's no not okay. Different. Well, it's no different from uh, we talk about this a lot when when someone's book is coming out and all of their friends and family are like, "Oh my god, I can't wait to get it! I can't wait to get it! I can't wait to get it!" And then the book's been out three weeks, and you say to your closest somebody, "Like, did you get it yet?" And they're like, "Shoot." I've got to go. And it's not a malevolent thing. They're not. No, I don't think. Right? Any, you know what? This is what's so interesting. The book community is so amazing. It, it I, it's the is. one area really, I have to say, as much as you may not even like someone, you don't want their book to fail. Right. This is such a raw, raw community because I think people really understand what it is to how every book sale in one sense does matter, how right. how hard it is to breathe life into, which goes back to the tangibility factor. So I do think this is a really warm and embraceive, it's embracing. The community itself is an embracing community. I don't think anyone means to be mean about it. Right. I do think... I don't know if they forget. I don't know if they realize how hard. I, I don't know what happened. Look, I think that that is just, I can't, even if you're having a dinner party, people, it's like people have a fear of saying yes to something and then having to be accountable to show up. It's just, it's just not that hard. And yet clearly it is because people can't seem to do it. Right. Just say yes. Yes. Just Where say are yes. all those people? Just be Shonda had, Rhimes and have yeah. a yes year. The but year where, yes. where, where are all those people? Why yeah. are they not just saying? Well, yes? I think Let's- that is a whole different conversation for, because I think it takes people down the path of there have been so many conversations in the last three years about, you know, introversion and extroversion and just people's different styles of and anxiety and all these things that have come up and and we could we could do any number of things with those right we can acknowledge them we can brush them under the, we can do whatever we want but there there are myriad reasons why it happens the key i think in a way is for authors not to take it personally and i think that's also the hardest thing to do yes because it's look it's it's somebody's bar and bat mitzvah. These mm-hmm. book of it is somebody's sweet 16 for the parents out there. Think of how bad you would feel as a parent if your five-year-old invited his entire or their entire class and you only had three people show up or three small children show up. It's all the same, you know? It's right. It's different. Even as a single woman, I feel like I didn't have the wedding. Like, Fuck you. Show the fuck up. This is my wedding. Show up. It's just, I think we should have a podcast called It's Just Not That Hard. It's just not that hard. That hard. And, well, you and- just said something that I think it, it may, it, I was thinking this before you said it, but on a little bit of a different level. It's like when you're invited to something and you say no, or you say yes, and then you end up canceling at the last minute. So many times in our brains, and I think we do this so that we feel better about what we're doing, we think, it's okay. There's 30 other people or 300 other people going. The challenge is that when 90% of the people all change their mind at the last minute and think it's okay, there's 300 people going. And then to your point, only four show up. Like that really sucks. It's hard because I'm not that person. So when I commit to something, I really commit. But this yeah. new terrain that we're in correct, has made it okay to cancel. See, we right. call cancel culture the wrong thing. Cancel mm. culture is it, we've mislabeled it regarding the Karens and the people we don't like anymore and the awful people who do awful things and we've stripped them of their job as we should and there should be consequences. We're, you know, very lackadaisical in all the wrong places. That's a different cancel culture. We have 100% misnamed it. What we do now and say, oh, we're going to go to something and then cancel, that's the cancel culture. Right, right, right. And, you know, I mean, I I guess in a way I'm trying to have some level of compassion for, for people who do end up doing it. I'm the same as you. If I commit, unless I'm in the hospital or have a super sick kid or something of that nature, I'm there. 
I'm there. It's just hard for me to wrap my head around three weeks from now. But that doesn't mean I'll cancel last minute if I don't need to. You're a waiter. That's all. You wait till that, you know, so yeah. invites get sent out. Yes. We sent out the invite six first. You know, now you have to, here's what you have to go through. It's so much dancing. It's exhausting. Yes. First, you have to do a save the day. Then, because I, I guess I have to prepare people to prepare for their schedule. Right. Then there's a gentle reminder that the invite is coming. Then you send the invite. And you have to send another reminder that says, hey, we see it in RSVP yet. It would be so nice if you did. So there's the, the nice reminder. Then there you get a little bit louder as if someone's in a coma where you're screaming in there and like, yeah, can you fucking RSVP already? Then you have to, once they've RSVP, you have to send the reminder. The final again. reminder. A final reminder. But here's a question. How is that different, if it is at all, from like, you know, they said they used to say that someone needed to be exposed to something, a product or a service or whatever, you know, seven to 13 times before they'd actually buy it. Now I'm hearing that's more like 20 plus times because, again, yeah, our intention span. Fascinating. Spans, See, that's fascinating, because we're just though. barraged constantly, right? And in the book space, I mean, there aren't, there literally, I could live to be 200 years old and there aren't enough hours in the day for me to read all the books that I want to read. So I have that's to be not on you either, though. This was, the oh, year. I know, I know, this, you know, this was the year one. This was the year of the book Two, It felt like everyone got a, a, a book deal or put out a book or um, has. a. I mean, like, it's been fascinating to watch everyone have a book, which which is fantastic, too, because it goes back to everybody has a voice and everybody should have a right to have a book if they want to have a book. But. That also didn't happen. The self-publishing arena, the right. hybrid arena, there are the reason this is the year of the book is because there was so much, there were so many new vehicles and and ways to do a book, promote a book, create a book, have a book. Uh, and the bookstore started to come back. And the way to promote that book came. It was, that's part of the challenge too. So if you can think like every, what happened to there are four other events that are happening on my night? I can't, who am I supposed to tell somebody like, I realize it's a cotillion, but forget the cotillion, come to the funeral. I mean, like, or, right, you right. know, come on, it's a symphony. I'll be four people for you. I'll be that, you know, I, my, my one person, I'll be four people for you. It's, you can, you know, I, I thought I tried to pick a Tuesday. I hoped it was a slow Tuesday. I waited for the holidays to go by. We didn't do it while people were away in the Hamptons. Fashion week came and went. I mean, like the Jewish mm -hmm. holidays came and went. I waited for Columbus Day to come. And, I mean, like I planned oh, for day. people, you know, for a holiday. I didn't, you know, then it was like, turn your mattress day, you know, for the people. Right. I'm going to turn right. your fucking hey, mattress Hey, I, so. I think yesterday was National Coffee Day, but the day before also was National Coffee Day. So I am I was confused, but I took because advantage Because they were still on the coffee. They were still yeah, on their coffee. Exactly. Exactly. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. Right. And, and then and then you want to try to be understanding. Right. And, and you want to try to not take it to come back to to your question, which was a or statement, which was a, a great one. How do you not take it personally? I had a conversation with myself earlier about this. Nobody else was there. It was just me and, and myself and I, all three of us were there. Right. Where, where you have to say, here's where it becomes realistic. But you, the brains have been trained to see all those likes and all those other yeah. things. And, yeah. But you know, I'm smart enough to, I'm going to post something with, I'm going to make everybody stand in a corner. So it looks like the whole room is filled, you know, and no one will know that it was only, you know, seven people. And, and I got the bartenders to get in the photo too. So it was nine, you know, right. there are ways to cheat the shot. That's what it's called insta live for a reason. And what, but, but the challenge there is that I, I feel like people, it's like, we know it's a lie. We know it's an insta lie. And yet, so often it's like we fail to look at that fact and we feel badly about ourselves because it's like, oh my God, they had 3000 people there. No, they had nine uh, and we I have zero. Well, you, sure. We made it. Sure. It's, it's, you know, and then everybody's like, oh, how about these great people who get on and they're telling their, you know, true selves and they're, they're sharing this, which is also great. But 
you know, how do you keep up with, we've lost the ability to self-regulate. We've lost the ability to share with the appropriate people. We've lost the ability to tell fact from fiction. We've Mm -hmm. lost a lot of I, again, I have a friend who thought they had a conversation with me and right. saw me. Right. So there's, and it does, listen, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm going to come off as the worst person ever. I just, it's real. I'm in, I'm in my own John Carpenter film. I'm wondering how <laughs> is, is where I, I, you know, and for the young kids who don't know who John Carpenter is, please let's look up John Carpenter. He's the guy who, who had these movies about there's only, you know, a handful of people who can see what's happening and, and everybody else is is not caught up yet. It's, it doesn't mean anybody's wrong. It doesn't mean right. anybody's a bad guy right. or a bad person or, or bad woman or bad they or anything. It just means I feel like I'm constantly watching a different movie and I, I can't believe where are all my moviegoers? You know, where, mm. where's everybody? Why, why? And it's so hard to be, it's so hard to be left of center. It's hard to be, it, it really is. It, it, it is, it's hard to be watching a different movie, even though night and day we tell people how wonderful it is. We still haven't told them it's wonderful, but it's really hard. It's really, it's really hard. It's hard yes. to come out with a book called The Joy of Funerals and know that you're right about it and and have people still, you know, I just got somebody just turned me down. They're like, it's just not positive enough for us. So and I'm like, but the word joy is in there. You right, know? the word joy, the word joy. Okay, so this is my last question for you. You know, so often people who either love PR and or are great at PR will admit that they're great at it and or love it for other people. But when it comes to their own product or service, they shrink, like they're terrible at it. They hate it. They do it. You're the opposite. You seem to just, you have such belief in your book, in the message, in yourself. Has that always been the case? Yes, sadly. Um, it, Why it, sadly? Because I also think, you know what, I, I think that we're not at a place yet either where people who are really specific are still considered difficult. And there's a really big difference between that. The people who are really confident, we, we keep telling people it's important to be confident. A lot of people are, they're turned off by people. We've confused confidence with, with arrogance. Yes. And, and that's, you know, that's unfortunate too. And I better be behind this. If I'm not behind this, why, why would I expect somebody else to be behind this? All I, day, you know, all day. But th- this, this is something else that doesn't make, you know, sense to me. How could I, why would you ever write something you don't believe in? And then expect other people to be, to believe in it. Listen, I don't. Th- I don't think it's that people write things they don't believe in. I think they don't realize how unsure they are of themselves until the book is being written or has been written, and then they have to put themselves in a position. So here's the analogy I'll give you: my kids, the the oldest four of them, and now the fifth, at going through high school, they were all like. I want to go far away for college. So my oldest daughter wanted to go to Miami. My, one wanted to go to NYU. One wanted to go to Pratt. One wanted to go to Boston. It was like as far as they could go in this country from me. The closer they got to graduating high school, they kept moving westward. Like we went from New York to Wisconsin to Chicago to you know, and and they all and now they all live with you while they, they were going right. They're all in school <laughs> in Arizona. Funnily enough, right? So I think when we're so far from the publishing of a book, we're we're distanced emotionally where we can think, oh my God, I love to go on tour. I love to stand in front of people. I love it when people have it in their hands and they're reading it and they're posting about it and they're commenting on it. And the closer we get to that, our actual insecurities about our story and ourselves and our right to tell it. And is it okay for me to be excited about my own book? Like, is it like me saying that my child is gorgeous? You know, you're not supposed to say that. You're not supposed to say that your own child is super talented. But maybe your child is gorgeous and super talented. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm good at, at some things and I'm terrible at other things, but I, 
there's, I know what I'm really bad at. You know, I am not a good volleyball player. You do not want me on your team, but you know what? I would never go out and say, oh my God, I'm an amazing volleyball player. Put me on. I'm right. the first to be like, buddy, you know, uh, don't, I listen, I, 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 I'm not good. I'm never going to get it over. Just leave me out in the sand. I, I, you but know, do you, do you think it's helped you that you write for the times and you write for big publications? Has that helped to ground your belief in your skill and your ability as a writer? Absolutely not. I, really? if I gave you all the no's. If I took everybody's no, I'd be selling shoelaces. And that's not if I wanted to. That's say, what listen, I love. Not that I don't want to. There's nothing wrong with selling shoelaces if you yeah. would like to sell shoelaces. Sure. I can't begin to tell you how I can tell. I can still pitch a number of stories. People, you know what? People are seeing the story that went in. They don't see exactly the other nine that I pitched. That some, but that. Doesn't mean they were bad stories. You know what? Very rarely do I I think the opposite. I'm like, wow, this was a great story. I can't believe, I can't believe we didn't take this story. It's just yeah. not, you know, I'm not that, I'm just not that person. I'm also a believer in, listen, not everything that I do is a Picasso. It's it's not. But the stuff that feels like a Picasso, I want to shout out, this feels like a Picasso. I wanted to save all the rejection letters just because I want, look at Seinfeld. How many times did, you know, he's got that, that, yep. you know, plaque up or the, the frame where people told him this was never going to be a success. If I listened to that, right. I would never, I, I, I really, I would be doing, I would be selling shells Two that bases. I found on the beach <laughs> or, you know, that while everybody else is playing volleyball, well, right. I just it's, it's just, it's also not, it's really not in, I, I just don't see the logic of it. I, I would want to go into a meeting, you know, would you want to marry someone who wasn't sure? That's the whole point of why someone says yes. Listen, right. that doesn't mean they don't change their mind. That doesn't mean they find out like, oh, this person's not as good a person as I thought. And, and then people get divorced later but on. But you too, don't go is- in thinking like, well, I mean, I, I think this is okay. I think this will do. <laughs> You, you hope not. There are people who do because I cover a lot of weddings and I cover a lot of relationships. But I mean, we do have the ninety day fiance and all these yes, things. So but right, you know what? You don't you don't serve people dinner and say, "Listen, eat it at your own expense. You may get salmonella." There you go. You you go in saying like, "I did the best I, I could." I, the meat may be a little not as tender. The chicken's not, but I'm really proud of this. I'm proud of this meal. We can always order in. So right. I, I, just in case, I just I just think that it is okay. We have to give each other. It's also okay to be proud of something. You can be proud of something without being arrogant. Absolutely. You, 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 you can be proud of something without being narcissistic. You Absolutely. Can. I think we've also confused that with being realistic, with, with knowing what we're good at and what we're not good at. And it is okay to have confidence and to not be afraid of somebody else who does. I don't right. want your book. I wrote one. I like my book. Right. You know, I right. well, can't we speak together? Can't we be on tour together? And if you sell more books, that's I'm happy for you. Exactly. But don't you think I really find that the author community is so great like that. I mean, there are obviously exceptions. There are exceptions in every space. But the amount of collaboration, specifically among women in the author space, I I absolutely love. I wish there was more of it. I mean, I, I, I would love like some sort of, you know, feminine war cry where we're all, you know, touring together. And, and then, you know, we were all at the same reading so that nobody had to make, you know, they didn't have to choose by reading your reading. Right. Like, like we should all win to be great. And if nothing else, we'd all be in the audience for each other. So yes, we could and there's Instagram that and, and say, right. We, yeah. Yes. And we were all there. And and right. I mean, like, where's that cult? Like I'll join, you know, and I I'll join like that cults. cult. Any I day will of the absolutely. Week. Where every day we're just at the, we're, maybe we should all just live at the bookstore. And then every day somebody different gets up to read, but we're all there and we're all, you know, someone selling cupcakes and, you know, this person's, writing the script and this person's, you know, hanging the lights and this person's sending out the invites. I mean, we, right. we should all be in this together because right. it it's really, it's really hard. It really, it really is hard. And hopefully, hopefully it becomes worth it. Yes. I think at the end of the day too, 
you you can wake up and you you know when I say hello to my friends, I'm saying hello to you know for I look at the bookcase and 98 percent of uh, 98 percent of those books are autographed. Those are those are my those are some of my friends, you know. Right. Um, and I feel really proud of the work that my colleagues and friends have. It I, it it really is so tangible. It's it for the kids who don't know what to do if their phone stops. That book will still be there if you need to be entertained. Read the book. That book is right. that book done on your Kindle. That right. book is there. That book is 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 there. So yeah. I I. I still believe in books and I still believe in us and I believe in each other. I want to be kumbaya. I feel like I was like sad Sally on this and, and people are going to be like, I don't, see, I don't think you were. Oh, we, and we talked about this the other day. I don't think you're sad Sally at all. And I had, you know, communicated to you that sometimes I feel like the negative Nancy of this whole thing, because well, I'm trying to match just, <laughs> sad Sally and negative Nancy. There's a children's book because I'm just trying to be, you know, realistic and honest. And I think honesty is important. And I will, as much as I will say, this is a hard space to be in and it's, it's, you know, all of that. It is equally one of the most gratifying, lovely, heartwarming spaces I've ever been in. And I don't ever want to leave it. I think that's also why I, I mean, I really love community. Yes. I, and I don't, it's so different. Yes. It feels wonderful to, to be, I needed, I lost my cake person. I needed a new cake person. I got on one of the communities for journalists and everyone was, was just, people came out with real suggestions. I love that community, but when you're home all day and you know, it's just you and your other personalities, me, myself and I, so all three of us, it's, it is, you know, it's a Carrie Fisher moment that hasn't happened. God rest her soul. But it it is, I, I'm I'm just here. It's just me. At the end right. of the day, I do need the social interaction. I do love the conferences. I do love those experiences. I love the readings because it's also a way to share the book or the work or to hear the questions from the audience and then to do it in person. I still yep. believe in in person. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you. No, thank Liz. Thank you so much. This was so nice.